For those that are here at the moment, um, my name's Andrew from Property Association. I'm joined from uh, by Alex from Chiac Realty, um, and basically we're just we're just going to look at both commercial um, and residential uh, perspectives for landlords, what they need to be looking at with new regulations that have come in. We, we're not going to sit here and read um, the regulation and, and you know, word for word and whatnot. We're just going to talk about experience. Uh, Alex and his team, they manage over a thousand uh, properties. So it's, it's expertise that uh, they're, they're basically dealing with this firsthand right now. You know, they're, they're basically in the trenches um, and there's no, there's no better um, experience than, than basically being hands on and being on the front line. So um, Alex, do you want to tell us a little bit about the operation there? And yeah, so basically we, um, we manage uh, over a thousand properties, a uh, mix of both commercial and residential. Um, we manage a lot of apartments, as probably a lot of people know, in Wentworth Point and Rhodes, um, but also all over Sydney, we've got, um, we've got properties that we manage. Excellent. All right. So we'll um, look, we'll jump we'll jump into it. But what what we want to the reason we're doing tonight is first of all we we're very big advocates of tenants and and landlords working very closely together. We think it's critical at this uh, moment in time, and and the best outcome for everybody will be open, transparent discussions. Correct, Alex. Correct. I think um, basically what's important is that that all parties work in good faith. And I think that's what the basis of a lot, a lot of these announcements and regulations that have been introduced is basically to bring both parties to the table to work in good faith to basically get a, get a, a, an outcome that's going to benefit everyone. And, and beyond that, we want to look at specific examples. And we also want to look at um, scenarios that you're dealing with firsthand so we can yeah. give people that, that best advice. And we want to also um, try and give some tips that can help people best protect this asset. Because for a lot of people, this is the, the largest investment they've got. Correct, yeah. So, so yeah, go, go. Yeah, so obviously we, we manage a lot, of, a lot of properties for a lot of mum and dad investors. And, you know, a lot of them are, are struggling through this period too. You know, they may have, you know, had their income reduced or, you know, they've lost their jobs or, so it's, it is a stressful time for a lot of people. Um, and basically we're trying to work with everyone just to try and manage, best manage the situations. Excellent, All right. So we've got, we've got probably most of the people on at the moment, which is great. So we're gonna, we're gonna get cracking. So we're gonna cover basically what's been announced. What's been announced is not exactly the same as what is actually being regulated. So we're gonna, we're gonna talk about um, that specifically talk about some tips, look at some specific examples. And if you've got some questions, let us know, we're gonna, we're gonna answer them. So we're gonna start off with um, commercial property and, and initially with the commercial property, um, one thing we wanna make clear is that property in general, it's, it's the realm of the state government, not the federal government. And, right. it's, and it's basically um, on a commercial level, we really haven't had the state come out and put specific regulations in, but on a national level, they put some guidelines, correct Alex? Correct, yes. Yeah. So the, the National Cabinet have um, released a National Code of Conduct for commercial leases, which basically outlines the parameters that they want the states to work within. Um, obviously, the, the, the states are part of that National Cabinet. Um, so it's, it's, you know, they're obviously on board with what's been announced. Um, but there are a lot of shortcomings with the code. And obviously, it's not as detailed as, detailed as we would like to see. Um, so we're hoping that when the regulations are announced or the where, when it finally is legislated, that we, um, it answers a lot of questions that we, we currently have. But and so what they're saying though at the moment is, is that basically in terms of sitting down and negotiating with your, your tenant, that um, you've got to take into account if they've had a, a loss, a percentage loss in terms of their turnover and, and factor that in to um, a, a rent waiver and a rent deferral. How's that work? Correct. So basically, um, to, to be eligible under this code, you need to have seen a reduction in your turnover of at least 30%. Um, and basically, the, they're, they're asking landlords to assess the rent waiver or rent deferral 
uh, proportionally to the reduction in turnover. For example, if a tenant has seen their turnover reduced by 40%, for instance, they're asking landlords to, as a minimum, issue a 40% um, reduction in rent, 50% of which will be paid as, as a rent deferral and 50% paid a, as a complete rent waiver. And in terms of, and they basically stopped um, being able to draw down on tenants' security, is that right? Correct. That's another, they've, they've put it prohibited uh, landlords from drawing on tenant security, whether it's a personal guarantee, whether it's a bond or a, um, or a bank guarantee. And so basically step one is the tenant, who's the business, they've got to qualify for JobKeeper. Correct, yeah. And, and number two is they've got to have a turnover of less than 50 million. Correct, yeah. Which I think would, would cover a lot of small, smaller landlords. And then in terms of the rent that's deferred, how's that being dealt with? So the rent that's deferred needs to be paid back over, uh, at the end of the pandemic period, paid back over the balance of the lease or over a minimum of 24 months, whichever is greater. Yeah, so let's get into some, some specific uh, situations and questions that I know a lot of commercial landlords are asking. So what we talked about now, is it, is it law? No, not yet. So basically, from what, from what we understand, this is the National Cabinet has released this code and we are awaiting the states to, to basically pass the legislation or regulations. And then in terms of what are, what are you doing with your particular properties that you manage to determine that the businesses or the tenant situation? So part of the, the for instance, part of the job keeper payment is that for them, for them to qualify, they need to show a reduction in turnover from this time last year. And basically we're using the same criteria that the government would use to, to assess the, the, um, the uh, business for the job keeper payment to also assess them on, on this um, code. So for instance, for the month of March, if they can show us that there's been a reduction in, or month of March and to April, if they can show us there's been a reduction in their turnover, um, then we will take that into account. So we're requesting income statements. Um, we're also requesting copies of whatever they're, they're providing to the government because come next week, people are going to start being able to register for the JobKeeper uh, payments and submit their, their documents. So we're also asking for copies of those um, and also stat statutory declarations to state that what they're providing us is um, true. And what about, um, so that's in terms of the rent we've discussed, what about in terms of outgoings? How's that being addressed? <clears throat> so in terms of outgoings, the, the, you know, in, in some cases, you know, these costs are going to continue to be incurred, such as statutory charges, council rates, water rates, um, land tax, etc. Well, albeit that, you know, them, the state government's now announced that they will pass uh, on some reduction in, in the land tax, provided that the um, landlord passes that on to the tenant. Um, but basically, if any, anywhere they can try and reduce the amount of outgoings, that's what the landlord should be trying to do. So you, yeah, so you touched base on that. So the, the state government came out and said, we're going to give you a 25% reduction on your land tax if it's passed on to your tenant as basically a rent reduction. Correct. Um, we'll, we'll touch base on that a, a bit later as well. But in terms of, let's say I've got a tenant, and again, we want to talk specific scenarios, and, and some people are going to um, really relate with these. And if you've got specific situations, just type in the Q&A um, question. But... I've got a tenant who's chose to close rather than say being forced to close, like gyms, for example, they're being forced to close. You know, how, how, do, you, how do you handle those situations? So we, ha we have had specific instances where tenants uh, have not found it feasible to remain open. Um, it, they're just not getting the traffic through their doors that they were before and therefore have chosen to close their doors even though they, they weren't mandated to close. Now, under the national code, again, that, that's where there's a lot of shortcomings with, with the code and we're hoping that these will be addressed in the, um, by the states. But basically, under the code, they would still be liable for 50% of the rent. And if I've got, say I've got a, a tenant, they're coming towards the end of their lease, the option period's kicking in. 
Um, and they're saying, look, I, I need more time. You know, like, there's, there's a bit of uncertainty at the moment. And, and we know that with commercial leases, there's a, there's a period there where they've got to execute the option or whatnot. Um, how's that been handled? So again, we, we're, we're dealing with those specific scenarios. Um, and we're finding that landlords are very um, accommodating. Um, obviously, you know, when you have tenants that are making decisions under pressure, they're probably not always going to make the best decision. Um, so if we can give them breathing space to extend the time where they, where they have to exercise that, that option, then we're doing so. And, and so I um, want to get into some specific, say, scenarios. Let's say I've got a tenant that is a travel agency, and that travel agency, obviously, we know how hard they've been, they've been hit. Um, and so right now they're just saying, well, we're, we're just, there's no point for us to, to be open. Um, we're in our late sixties. We can't foresee, uh, you know, we've got two years left on our lease, but we can't foresee this industry picking up anytime soon. And we're basically done. We need to shut shop. So, so basically what we would be advising the landlords is to try and mitigate the loss as best as possible. And, um, what we mean by that is if, the tenants not going to fulfill their obligations of their of their lease, then you know you're best to try and find somebody that, that that can pay some rent rather than have a tenant that's not going to pay any rent. But regardless, you know that the the national code of um, that, that's been released does state that the tenants still need to fulfill the obligations of their lease, and they need to they're bound by the terms of that lease, albeit that they will have a rent reduction. Um, they can't just walk out on, on the lease. So let's talk about um, with business and, and obviously having commercial property and, and having a business tenant. Was there a way, of pre like, was there a pre prevention, some sort of, you know, something you could have done to protect your asset in this circumstance? Or? Well, it, the short answer is prob probably that there is, a, there probably was a way if you, you know, you, you foresaw this was going to happen, you could probably go out and get cover for, for pandemics. But really, you know, who could have predicted, you know, what, we, what we're facing right now? And a lot of business interruption insurance, a lot of um, landlord insurance, com particularly commercial landlord insurance, you know, excludes uh, pandemic cover. And so, and obviously, we, we've had a chat about this and we've talked about you know, what, what tips we would be giving to, to clients with commercial property as landlords at, at the moment. And one thing that we spoke about is that um, what one tip would be, I know as a landlord, you know, when the Reserve Bank provides a rate cut and my bank doesn't give me all that and, and gives me 0.2 and, or 0.17 rather than the 0.25, you know, I get really frustrated and upset. But then I sat back and thought about it and thought, well, even though I am getting a, a 0.17 reduction, I've never given a reduction to a tenant. So, you know, one of those tips now is to reassess your asset. Correct, yeah. It's important, I mean, at, at any time, but also, especially now, you know, you want to make sure you're getting the best, you know, you've got the best interest rate or you've got a decent interest rate on your, on your property. But keep in mind, you know, we have, seen rent, we have seen interest rates cut, you know, a few times over the past 12 to 18 months. So, you know, I'm confident there's a lot of landlords there that, you know, have been benefiting from that. And now, unfortunately, you know, you might have to pass on a rent reduction to your tenant. Yeah, that's right. You've got to call a spade a spade. Like if, you're, if your interest rates drop, those, your payments are 25% less than what they were, then you can afford that reduction in rent and still be in a similar situation. And part of assessing the asset is assessing the marketplace right now. You know, if I lose that tenant, and what's my vacancy like? How long? What's the new tenant going to pay me? You know, it's, it's really looking at that big picture. Yeah. So ideally you want to avoid having a vacant, you know, property, especially, you know, anyone who's got a property in those, those areas that have been hit hardest, such as hospitality, retail, um, you know, they're not, you're going to struggle to find a tenant now. And if you do, you know, at what rent will it be? That's right. So, so that's one of the tips. Assess and, and be honest with yourself. Look at your situation. What can you forego at the moment to get? You know, commercial property for me has always been something that I, I see it as a partnership with your tenant. 
the, the better your tenant's doing, the better your asset's doing. So in terms of another tip is that paper trail is really important. So we talked about you know, assessing the, the tenant, looking at their situation. Um, I know you guys are really strong on that, but, but talk about the importance of the paper trail in regards to the current environment. So it's, it's very important. I mean, uh, most of our, our any, I mean, it, we may negotiate over the phone or come to agreements over the phone, but everything is, is then documented. So whether it be um, emails or, or, you know, getting the agreement signed as to what the new arrangement is, it, it is essential to the whole, pro, to the whole process. And, and so what we're saying is assess the situation, keep, keep the paper trail. What about, one thing I think that we should be doing as landlords is, is uniting here and uniting with our tenants as well, but we should, be, we should be writing to our local members. If you're hurting as a landlord, you know, th these people are there to represent us. And, and, you know, unfortunately, if we don't tell them, they don't know. And, and so sometimes, you know, if 10, 15, 20, 100 landlords say, hey, you know, I lost my job too. I'm, I'm finding it tough too. I need more help. You know, it's, it's another important thing that we all should be doing to raise the profile of, of the current situation. And then what about potentially looking at your space, working with your tenant and saying, there's a couple of extra car spaces here. Do you need them? Maybe we can sublet them out. There's some space here. Maybe we can, you know, top up the rent in that way. Yeah, anything that they can do to, to supplement that loss of income then you know, ideally we'd be encouraging them to, to try and do. That's so, um, what, in terms of the commercial environment at the moment, because it's, it's at the stage where we can see the businesses, they're trying their best to hold on. You know, I, I know you've, you've said it, but you've, you've actually been in touch with all the businesses, seeing where they're at. Yeah, so we've been very proactive, especially with the businesses that we know that have been directly impacted. Like I said, you know, ones that have been forced to close or, you know, and we've made proactive efforts to try and come to arrangements with all, all our tenants. Now, a lot of them are still in progress and, you know, we're, we are still trying to get more clarity around some of the things that were announced in the code. Um, but largely, you know, if all parties work in good faith, I think we're going to, we're confident we're going to be able to come to arrangements with most. So switching, switching over to more of the residential side of, of things, and that's um, probably a bigger, a bigger pool of, of mum and dad investors. So that's something that um, is very dear to me because a lot of time investors get a bad rap. The, the people think they're these tycoons, but the reality is even the New South Wales government announcement about land tax uh, relief is only going to benefit 16% of people. So, so 84% of investors are, are not even close to that threshold. Um, so it's important that uh, we give a lot of support, which is, which is why we're running this um, session at the moment for information. So switching over to, to the residential, um, that, that's actually now become uh, regulation, which is, which is basically law, you know? Yeah, correct. And, and that's, of, that's as of yesterday. Yeah, so yesterday the state government published their regulations on the um, on uh, tenants that are impacted by COVID-19 and there's a few significant things that were announced in that regulation. Um, so we've quickly had to, to adjust um, a few of our processes to, to sort of meet um, those requirements. So let's run through some of those key things. So probably the first most uh, important thing they've raised is that they've just basically put a 60-day stop on landlords terminating, giving termination notices, on landlords going to tribunal. They've just basically said there's a 60 day halt on that. Basically at the moment, the, um, the, there's, a, there's, a, there's a stay on those termination notices. So if a tenant's been impacted by COVID-19 and they, they can show that, that hardship. So, and basically the definition of that is that they've seen a reduction of 25% or more in their household income, then you, as a landlord, cannot terminate them for the next 60 days. And so then you gotta wait for that 60 days to lapse and then um, basically you can issue it, but something that's used a lot is that you've, you've you know, they, they wanna make sure you've sat down, you've, you've Correct, appreciated yeah. in good faith. The, the, the goal of the regulation is to get landlords and tenants to sit together or Zoom together 
and try to come to some arrangement and basically chart a path out of this. And then another thing that came out of the regulations is that they've extended the notice period for, for certain um, other lease termination reasons for 90 days. Just explain to people that are, what, what was it before and what is it now? So basically end of fixed term. So what an end of fixed term notice is, is if you give notice to your tenant to, to end the lease at the lease end day, or, or you give notice prior to the lease end date to, to end it shortly thereafter. It was previously, it was 30 days notice. It is now 90 days notice. So if you're a landlord and you're planning to move into your property and your lease ends you know, next month, you now need to wait 90 days. You need to issue a 90 day notice before you can terminate that lease. And so you guys, as I said, hands on frontline, what, what are you, is a, a big impact to your business at the moment? You know, you obviously you, we said you're managing over a thousand properties at the moment. Yeah, so we've had about a hundred requests. So, so roughly about 10% of our tenants have come to us um, with requests um, for hardship and they all at varying degrees. So some-, so, some so this, Let us know, so they come to you, they say, look, we're struggling for whatever reason. Uh, talk about what's that sort of support material that you start to go into, what do you, what do, you do then? Yeah, so what, what we're looking for is, is for, for evidence of that, that hardship. So whether it be a termination letter, if they've lost their job, if they've been stood down, um, we're asking for if their hours have been reduced, again, confirmation of that, whether it be a letter from their employer, um, copies of pay slips prior to COVID-19 versus now to show how they've been impacted. Um, yeah, so they're, they're the evidence that, that's the evidence that we're looking for. And obviously um, you, there's been a bit of attention, there's some agents saying to, to the tenants, oh look, you know, you can tap into your super and whatnot. You know, we're, you know, obviously we're not here to give financial advice, but we can ask the questions if they've explored that. Yeah, so obviously it's it's best not to give advice around that, but yeah, I, I, don't, I don't see a problem with asking if they've looked into it or they've sought advice around that area. And if, you, if you're checking against, say, like you said, the, you know, it's similar to the, the commercial and the business tenant, if they qualify for the job seeker, then you know that they've met that criteria um, is that something you're looking at for the tenants if they if they've you know transitioned onto uh, job keeper or job seeker? Correct. So, so if a tenant has lost their income but then qualifies for the job keeper or job seeker payment, then those will be um, included in the calculations. And what we're stressing at the moment is that based on this regulation, the the terminology negotiating with good faith, sitting at the table, it, it's really it's spoken about many times in the regulation so you know, keeping that paper trail and proof that you've actually tried to work with the tenant is critical because let's say you get past this stage and for whatever reason um you should, they're still struggling and you need to move on the tribunal is going to take that into account Correct. So even basically there, there is a, a six month moratorium on evictions but the, for the first 60 days, under no circumstances, if the tenant can prove that their hardship due to COVID-19, can you terminate the lease? Now, after the 60 days, you can apply for a term, you can issue a termination notice and you can apply um, for an order of possession to, to the tribunal or order for termination. But you need to have proven that you have tried to negotiate with the tenant and, and basically, um, you know, you've been fair and reasonable. And then the, the other big topic that everyone's been talking about is landlord insurance. You know, where it, we've, you know, there's a lot of people saying um, that they're not, they're, not, they're not covering a certain portion. If you've negotiated a rent reduction, that they're not going to come to the party. Um, what, have, what are your thoughts in terms of uh, the landlord insurance side of things? So again, it, it, it is a bit of a gray area. We're constantly on the phone to the major um, uh, landlord insurers. Um, and just especially rec as recently as today, after uh, following you know, the regulation that was published yesterday, um, we're waiting on EBM to provide more details as to what is covered exactly and, and how it will impact our landlords. So what we do know 
is that if you agree to a rent reduction with the tenant, um, basically your insurance will now be covered at the new lower amount. So you can't expect the insurer to cover for that amount that you, um, you, you've reduced the rent by. And if I'm a landlord who um, historically, and, and you and I know um, being in the industry that sometimes there are some landlords who they're, they're, they're tough to convince on getting the landlord insurance, um, but now they're, they're thinking, oh, I've got to get it. Yeah, where, where are they at? Uh, it, it is a, it's a bit late now. Um, most landlord insurers have stopped taking new policies. Um, and those that I'm aware of that are still taking policies exclude rent default. So, um, you know, we were sort of on top of this early and we were encouraging landlords to, to look into landlord insurance, you know, at the beginning of this, maybe about three weeks ago. So, you know, most of our landlords do have landlord insurance, so. Um, as we, we've got a, a question, which is, um, how do landlords or, or their managing agents know that the information provided by the tenant is actually factual or they're just not you know, making it up to get a rent reduction? Yeah, so it's a good question, which is again, why we're asking for the, the evidence. It's similar to the way you would assess the tenant when they're starting the tenancy. You know, we wouldn't just take the, the tenant's word for it. We are getting pay slips, bank statements that, that match those, those pay slips and also verifying, you know, the changes with the employer. Um, we've got another, another one as well, which is um, during the negotiations, a landlord's allowed to see this evidence. So in terms of, because, you know, when, when we're getting information on an applicant, there's only so much we can share with the landlords for privacy purposes. Um, what, what type of evidence are we going to be able to share with landlords? I mean, it, it, technically speaking, we can, we can share because we can share that information with the landlords. Um, you know, we, um, the privacy disclosure there allows us to, to share the, um, the details with, with the landlord. Okay. And then just, uh, we'll, we'll keep moving, but we'll come back to other questions as well. Um, one of the things I wanted to talk about is uh, there's something that a lot of landlords are scared of. One, one thing is, what if my tenant takes this as a basically free for all, I'm not paying rent, I'm not going to talk to the property manager, they can't kick me out, you know, I'm not going to show any proof. What, what, what happens there? Yeah, so again, we are, we are seeing some instances of that. Thankfully, not, not too many. Um, but we have instances where we've, art, we've requested uh, documents from tenants and they failed to provide them and they just have been, they've been non-responsive. Um, in those cases, they wouldn't qualify, um, if they can't prove they've been impacted, they wouldn't qualify under this regulation. Um, so you would still be able to terminate the, the lease. Now, whether, um, you know, we haven't tested that yet through the tribunal, um, but we're, we're going to start going through those motions now yeah and, and another good question is um you know in terms of checking the pay slips to show that that 25 percent reduction has been hit um you know what about their savings you know uh, is there is there a way to say hang on you know you've got 25 grand just sitting there yeah uh, with with regard to the savings that's the, the regulation is silent on that but if a tenant, you know, hasn't had an impact, I mean, we, we have some tenants that have acted in, in, in good faith and do have the money there, even though their income has been impacted, they do have a safety net that they're, they're basically tapping into to, to continue to meet their obligations of the police. I think part of that also will come back to, you know, if when you're negotiating that good faith, that's part of it. If you've got some savings, it's not, you know, and if you, and if you, you don't, um, and, and when it gets to fair trading or the tribunal, they're going to assess Correct. that. They're going to, you're, you're going to, as a property manager, you're going to put that case forward to say, look, we've assessed this person. Yes, their income had dropped. Their savings were always strong, which is why they got the property in the first place. That's right. There, there is an element of fair and reasonable in the regulation, which means, you know, and, and again, the, the rent reduction isn't necessarily a rent waiver. It can be it can be a deferral. So, you know, tenants can't necessarily assume that the rent is going to be completely, is going to be waived. 
you know, it may be may be the case that where they have to pay it back later. So if they have the capability of paying it now, that you know they should they should do so. And is there anything in the regulations in in terms of a a rental subsidy? In, in terms of a, a, an amount and of how much? Or? Yeah, from my understanding, obviously it's it's basically the government stepping in with job seeker job keeper yeah. to, to keep people propped up. Um, yep. The only announcement in terms of the, the subsidy, it, it, there's no fixed amount. It's all about sitting down negotiating circumstances. Yeah. Yeah. So like I said, is an element of, of it's good. It's relies on good faith and it relies on both parties being fair and reasonable. And, and um, in terms of, in terms of those tenants that um, are being a bit more pro problematic, I think what we've been saying is that as soon as they touch base with you, education is critical. Yeah, correct. I mean, it, it's been well publicised about the initiatives that the government's you know running with with job keeper and and job seeker and and these things. But if the tenant hasn't sought assistance from you know Centrelink or hasn't spoken to their employer about job keeper, then you know they, they should be definitely doing that. And then there's a, a question about um, some on the TV recently. Some renters planning a rent strike. And they're saying, uh, the question is, do, do we think there's grounds for this sort of action in this climate? I, I mean, I'll just, I'll, I'll jump on this quickly. It, people are hurting, you know, and, and um, tenants, landlords, you know, we're all human. Um, and we, we, a lot of landlords, it's one property they've got and they've lost their job too. And it's not a competition of who's hurting more. Um, it's not even an option for, for some people at the moment to cash in on the asset, like still the asset, it's not even an option. So, um, you know, in this in this climate, I think more than ever, I think tenants and landlords have to unite because one thing that's missed in this whole um, scenario where where the media is trying to put us up against each other and there's bodies that are that's trying to put us up against each other is that um, landlords provide housing. They provide housing and they give tenants choice. They give tenants choice to say, oh, look, I can't afford to live on Bondi Beach, but aren't I lucky that somebody bought an asset there that I can rent, you know, or I would be dealing with the government for my housing. Instead of calling someone like Alex or someone from Alex's team to fix my leaky toilet, I'd be calling a government hotline, you know, potentially dealing with a bureaucrat to fix um, that issue. But what do you think about rent strike, Alex? Yeah, look, I mean, luckily, we've the vast majority of tenants that we've been dealing with in this scenario have been fair and reasonable to actually be to, to sit down with your with your landlord or your property manager and try and work through the issues. Yeah. You know? And then one one last question. We're going to move on. But what if what if your your tenants a foreign student or they've got like a student visa or whatnot? Um, and you know they're supposed to have a certain amount of money to be able to come and fund their education and whatnot. Um, what's what's your take on that? Yeah. So uh, again, another situation that we're we're currently dealing with, um, where they've they've got a scholarship and this, the the um, the university is actually paying a significant portion of their their living expenses. Um, you know it. We, we're trying to work through that at the moment, but there's no clear cut answer. If their, if their um, income hasn't been reduced by the 25%, then you know, as far as we're, we know, they should be continue to pay the rent as normal. And obviously the questions we've had, there've been some good examples. So we're, we're, we, we had some examples, but we've addressed those through um, people's questions, which is fantastic. Um, something that, that hasn't been asked is, what if I've assessed um, Mary Jo and um, she got the property based on her income, everything's fine. And then Mary Jo calls and says, hey, my husband lost their job, um, but they're not on the lease, just Mary Jo's on the lease. What's that situation? Okay, so, yeah, so the regulation refers to household income, whether they're on the lease or any tenant that, that contributes or any occupant of the property that, is a rent paying occupant, their uh, income needs to be assessed as part of the application, as part of the, the uh, calculation. Okay, and then in terms so of- in, in that regard, 
So in that regard, even though he, he has lost, if he has been paying, contributing towards the rent and he has lost his job, then his income would, his loss of income would be um, part of the calculation. So um, in, in what we want to get to now is some tips, but I've got one, one more question. Um, how, how do you prove that they're an occupant? You know, so in terms of what we just spoke about, um, because how, how, how can we sort of prove yeah. to say, hey, they actually are living there? Um, let's say, let's say the lease, the lease had one person on there, and all of a sudden yeah. the partners come in and whatnot. Yeah. Well, essentially they're in breach of the the lease. I mean, when we when we um, uh, prove any tenants, we get a full list of the occupants, whether they're named on the lease or not. Um, we're notified of who's going to be living there. But if there's people that are living there that shouldn't be living there, then then that's a breach. Essentially, it's a breach of the agreement. Okay. So moving on to some, some tips for residential landlords. It's a little bit similar to the, the commercial. The first thing we would be saying to people is uh, reassess your asset and understand the market that you're operating in now. Because the market that we're operating in now is vastly different to six weeks ago. Correct. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, what, what I think is important is to assess if, if you were to lose your tenant, what rent could you expect in the current market and how long could you expect your property to be um, vacant? Now, factoring those things in, you know, you, you, if you do the calculations, I think you, a lot of landlords are going to find that they're better off giving a modest re reduction in rent than going through that whole process. Yeah, I think in the long run, um, you know, potentially you might even look at staging your approach with your tenant, because we don't know where this is gonna play out. Yeah, correct, yeah. So, I mean, the, the situation is, is rapidly evolving. I mean, um, the Prime Minister announced um, today that the restrictions were gonna, were gonna stay in place for a further four weeks. Um, you know, we hope, you know, in, in four weeks, they'll be in a position to start lifting some of the restrictions and people, some people can start going back to work, some businesses can start opening up. So I would be hesitant to, to agree to anything, you know, that is, long, that is longer term, you know, in this, relatively speaking, um, if the situation is constantly changing. And we've got another comment here, which is basically saying that, you know, it looks like the landlord's got to, got to cop, the, cop the brunt of the situation. Um, you know, and most landlords are happy to negotiate and work and, and whatnot, which I, which I agree. Um, but I think that's where another tip that we came up with is that you've got to write to your local member. You've got to let these people know that, you know, we want you to hit the banks. We want you to hit the banks. You know what I mean? Because they, we're talking about the situation like there's only two parties here. But really there's four. There's the tenant, there's the landlord, there's the bank, because very few people can have the, the, the asset without the bank. And let's not focus on that minor portion. Let's, let's focus on the 85, 90% that you know, have a bank involved. And then there's the government. You know, there's the government that needs to, to manipulate the situation to make sure that the tenants can come out of it and make sure that the landlords can come out of it and make sure that we've got a healthy banking system. I'm not saying to throw the banks under the bus, but, but I think we need to be writing to our local members so they can truly understand what landlords are, are feeling and experiencing right now. Correct, I agree 100%. I mean, the, the banks have obviously talked about deferring um, uh, payments, but at the end of the day, those payments are gonna, going to need to be paid, whether it be when, when the property is sold or added to the, to the loan term. So while, while it might uh, provide temporary relief, it actually doesn't, you know, financially doesn't give a, uh, it's not a waiver. Yeah. Um, we've got another question, which is in terms of what we're seeing in the marketplace, what, what percentage sort of decrease would be recommended um, that, that landlords should, should give? I, I think, you know, our advice on that would be, you've really got to study your, your market, yeah? Yeah, correct. Yeah, every market is different and, and every market has been impacted in different ways. Like, give you an example, in areas that are traditionally, you have a lot of students renting, international students, you know, those marketplaces have 
heavily been have been heavily impacted by what's happening. Obviously, you know, um, without those international students here, a lot of properties are sitting empty, and you know the rents are dropping significantly. Whereas you compare other areas where there's a lot of you know uh, professionals or young families, or they haven't been as impacted. And what about, are you finding tenants are explored? Let's say I've got a two bedroom, things were good, everything was rosy. I didn't really need a two bedroom. I've got, I've got a two bedroom. Now I'm trying to find um, someone to add to the lease. Is that something that you've encountered during this period? Um, we haven't had, we haven't seen too much of, of that, but obviously if, you, if your income's been impacted and you're probably living you know, in a bigger property than you need, or then you know, that might be a good idea, but obviously, you always want to. You've got to check with your agent whether it, the landlord's going to be, um, you know, going to be uh, welcoming to that. To that. Um, and another comment which I want to raise because one of the people that are uh, uh, joining us, they're um, they're a commercial tenant, and they're basically saying that they're they're receiving, you know, no communication. They're getting the silent treatment, um, you know. And and look, unfortunately, from our point of view, that's 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 poor property management, you know. Um, because the outcome is not going to be good for anyone. So whilst as an agency, you know, the, the client is the landlord, that's who the agreement, that's who pays our bills, you know, it's in their vested interest that yeah, we're working closely. Ultimately, we, we view the tenant as the, the landlord's customer. And, you know, you, you have to look after, at the end of the day, have to look after the customer, obviously within reason. But there should be no excuses for, for, for not communicating and, and keeping your, your tenant up to date. And that's right. So, we, we we'll, if there's more questions, keep them coming. But we'll we'll start to wrap up a, a basic summary, which is at the moment, you know, if things are going smooth with tenancy. Just let it be. Don't rock the boat. You know, because there's going to be. We don't know where this is going to end. We don't know where it's going to go. So. A lot of landlords, they're, they're super generous and they're, they're thinking, look, things aren't great. I can help a little bit. Um, but, but maybe just sit back and watch where it goes because you might come out and help now when the tenant doesn't necessarily need it so much. And then when they need it more, you think, well, I've already helped out. But then you'll be forced to help out more, correct? Yeah. Look, I think from what we're seeing, the vast majority of tenants are still doing okay. Um, you know, and we probably, we're, we're trying now to focus our resources and energy on, on those ones that are struggling to try and get a, a good outcome. And so, so that's the first thing is if things are going smooth. Don't rock the boat. The second thing is as soon as there's that notification or someone comes and says, Hey, I'm feeling the pain. The next thing is boom, education, educating the tenant and educating the landlord of the parameters they need to be working through. Yeah. Correct. Yeah, and then so bang education, and then let's start assessing the tenant and their situation. Then let's start assisting the landlord to assess their situation because we're starting to understand where the tenants at. We're starting to understand what they can and can't do. Now we need to look at the landlord and help the landlord understand. Well, you know what? I can probably take a fifteen percent hit because I'm in this position where my interest has dropped, so on and so forth, and start to to bring it together into a solution. Yeah, uh, exactly. I mean, ultimately, the, the goal is to, to try and keep it in and, and, and at the same time, you know, you, you don't want to give away too much. You know, is every or most people, their definition of fair and reasonable is, is in line, but you, you do have, you know, some people that, and so, that don't, yeah, I think that I, aren't negotiating yes. within those parameters, basically. And, the, and then the last thing is obviously to be negotiating in good faith and within the guidelines. I think, I'm not sure, Alex, if it's your internet, it might be mine or yours. Like, can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, yeah it's kicked in, yeah. So, we get the notice, there's some issue, bang, first thing is education. Second thing is start assessing the tenant. Third, you start working with the landlord to assess their situation. And fourth, you sit down in good faith and negotiate within the parameters. And really you would say eight out of eight or nine out of 10 times, you're gonna come up with the best solution. 
Co- correct, yeah. Yeah, and so... We're, we're not having too much trouble with, with them, but it's, it's all about education, like you said. And then in terms of uh, another question um, is what about strata fees? So um, have you heard of any you know, reprieve in that regard? Um, we, we haven't heard too much on, on that side of things. Um, obviously, where stratas can try and reduce their costs, they're probably you know, are working towards that. For example, if there's facilities in a building or in a state that, that can't be used, if they can cut back on costs and try and pass some of those savings on to um, onto landlords then, or, or owners, then that's ideal. Um, but what we're finding is in a lot of cases, um, you know, stratas would have contracts with, with, with those contractors that they can't necessar- necessarily um, you know, put, on, put on hold. Well, well that's, that's probably a wrap at the moment, but um, if there's more information, if you need anything, you can contact me, you can contact Alex, leave the comments, we'll get in touch um, with everybody. Um, in terms of if, you, if you've got a particular situation, something that's really kept you un, uneasy, definitely reach out. Um, you know, I'm very fortunate. Alex and his team manage um, my properties and, and you know, it, it, I'm at ease because I know they're on top of everything. So um, thank you, Alex. Thank you to the team. And thanks for that knowledge because I think it's really important. Yeah. And I think a lot of people, uh, just so you know, too, they're, they're, they're appreciative of the information tonight. So um, thank you, everyone, for joining. And if there's topics that you want us to dig into, just let us know. Yeah, love to help. And if there's, like I said, if there's anything we didn't touch on, if anything comes up in the future, we're here to help. Cheers. Have a good night, everyone.